Good morning. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Most high and holy God, in this moment we confess that we do indeed need you. I confess that. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour, every moment of my life, I need thee. And I pray right now, oh God, that you would guide me and that you would guard me, that you would put your words in my mouth and make me now your prophet. Lead us to your truth, and in that truth, set us free. Amen. Well, not long ago, I walked to my mailbox, and I reached inside, expecting to find nothing more than the usual bills and advertisements. But instead, I reached inside, and I found this. This is a letter. It's a personal letter from a friend of mine named Scott. Now, what's interesting about this letter is that Scott is in prison. Yeah, really. Uh, I wish it weren't the case, but it is the case that Scott is in prison. Now, I've known Scott and his family for many years. They have always been very good to me. And just as an aside, uh, let me tell you that Scott's mother is one of the best cooks you will ever find. All right? If Scott ever did wrong, it was not because he was malnourished. All right? Let me tell you that if you had a meeting with the President of the United States and Scott's mother invited you to dinner, well, you would call the White House and you would say, Mr. President, I'm sorry. You'll just have to wait. I am going to dinner. Scott made a mistake in life that he deeply regrets. Let me read you a part of the letter that he wrote to me. He says, Dear Justin, I made a horrible mistake and I'm paying my debt for it now. This experience has given me time to think and resolve some personal issues that I most likely would have never bothered to resolve otherwise. Now, the reason I bring this up is because when the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the, to the Philippians, he was in prison too. Three times in the first chapter, he mentions his incarceration. He mentions the imperial guards who watch him like hawks. He wrote to a church to some friends of his in the city of Philippi, and he wrote from a jail, most likely in the city of Rome. From Rome to Philippi, from jail to church. So in one hand, I have a letter from Scott to me, and in the other hand, I have a letter from Paul to the Philippians, and both of them are letters from prison. Well, in his letter, uh, Paul talks about a lot of things that you might expect Paul to talk about. Uh, he talks about prayer, and he talks about praise, and he talks about the gospel, and he talks about God. Uh, you know Paul, uh, always talking about God, uh, never being able to shut up about God. Well, at one point, Paul raises a topic that you might not expect him to raise. Citizenship. Citizenship in a national state. In chapter 3, he mentions the fact that he is a Jew and a member of the nation of Israel. Uh, there were 12 tribes of Israel, and he even mentions that he's a member of the tribe of Benjamin. But Paul carried more than one passport, so to speak, because he was not just a member of the nation of Israel, he was also a citizen in the Roman Empire. In fact, that is the reason why he was in Rome in the first place. You see, Paul had been accused of inciting a riot, a riot at, of all places, the temple in the city of Jerusalem probably the last place that you would ever want to have a riot. The whole city had been whipped up into a frenzy. And now I'm not saying that Paul was guilty, because he wasn't. And if you read the book of Acts, you can find out why. But I do want to say this. I do want to say this. If you are following Jesus, and I mean if you are really following Jesus, Jesus. You may sometimes be accused of disturbing 
the peace. You may sometimes be accused of stirring the pot. More on that a little bit later. For now, let's just get back to the story. So Paul was arrested. But because he was a Roman citizen, he had certain rights, one of which was the right to trial. And that's the reason he was in Rome. He had, quote, unquote, appealed to Caesar, which was his right to do. And so he was taken off to Rome. And of course, the whole time that he was awaiting trial, he was detained and held in custody. And with some extra time on his hands, he wrote a few letters. Paul carried more than one passport. Jew in the nation of Israel and citizen in the Roman Empire. But if you think it stops there, you've got another thing coming. Because it goes even further. You see, Paul had more passports than a spy in the CIA. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, he says, Many of whom I have already told you, and of whom I tell you again, even with tears, many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But, listen, but our citizenship is in heaven, from which we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. Paul's citizenship in the nation of Israel gave him great pride. He was the strictest of Pharisees and a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul's citizenship in the Roman Empire gave him great privilege. During that riot in Jerusalem, he would have gotten mob justice. Mob justice were it not for the fact that he was a Roman citizen. That saved his life. It gave him a more proper trial, and it afforded him at least the chance at having justice. But even though his citizenship in the nation of Israel gave him great pride, and his citizenship in the Roman Empire gave him great privilege, his citizenship in the kingdom of heaven was his priority. Pride, privilege, priority. To Paul, the kingdom of heaven is what mattered most. It's what he held most dear and what he made the priority over the other two. Uh, this week I was reading a commentary on the book of Philippians and this is what it has to say about Paul's message. Paul is reminding the Philippians that they should look to Christ, not Caesar, as their model of behavior and that their primary allegiance is to God and God's kingdom. Sisters and brothers, just like Paul, we carry more than one passport. We have dual citizenship, so to speak. We are all citizens of an earthly nation, but we are also citizens of a heavenly kingdom. All who are in Christ are citizens in the kingdom of God. So, we may very well pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, but our highest allegiance should always be pledged to the cross of Christ and the kingdom of God. And if the two, the earthly nation and the heavenly kingdom, if the two are ever at odds with each other, we know with whom we should side. We know which authority we should obey. We know which is our priority. Our master is no Caesar. Our master is no Congress. Our master is no court. Our real, true, and ultimate master is Christ. Almost 2,000 years after Paul wrote from a jail cell in Rome, uh, there was another follower of Christ who wrote from a jail cell in Alabama. And that person was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was in Birmingham, Alabama, leading a civil rights protest, and he was arrested and locked up in jail. Uh, and now several clergymen 
in Alabama had criticized Dr. King. And so, in jail, with some extra time on his hands, he decided to write a letter. He decided to respond to his critics and detractors. And this is a portion of what he says in his letter from Birmingham City Jail. You ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying other laws? Well, the answer is found in the fact that, we, that there are two types of laws, those which are just and those which are unjust. A just law is a code that squares with the moral law of God. An unjust law is one that does not. To use the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a man-made law that is not rooted in God's law. And I would also agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Friends, what if? What if you were in a position where you could either obey the law of an earthly nation where you reside temporarily, or the law of the heavenly kingdom where you hope to reside eternally? What if one day you found yourself in some ethical dilemma, some moral quandary that pitted the law of the land against the law of the kingdom? What would you do? Would you have the willingness to be arrested? Would you have the courage to practice civil disobedience? Would you have the wherewithal to perform some creative, nonviolent resistance? Would you have the guts to speak a word of protest? Would you start a petition or a boycott? Would you raise a picket sign? Would you speak with an elected official? Would you call his or her office and demand a meeting? Would you leverage your wealth and influence for a good and godly cause? We are all citizens of some earthly power. And for most of us, that means the United States of America. But we are also a part of something larger, greater, and better by far. All who are in Christ are citizens in the kingdom of heaven. And we should pledge our ultimate allegiance to God. Now, we should do this for many reasons, but today I just want to give you one reason why we should do so. We should pledge our ultimate allegiance to God because God made the ultimate sacrifice for us. Ultimate allegiance, ultimate sacrifice. God should get ultimate allegiance from us because God made the ultimate sacrifice for us. In September of 2006, Petty Officer Second Class Michael Mansour, a Navy SEAL, was serving in Ramadi, Iraq. And back then, and sadly still today, Ramadi was an especially dangerous village west of Baghdad. It was no place that you or I would ever want to be, but Michael Mansour was there, and he and a handful of other soldiers were on a rooftop providing sniper security for a joint mission of American and Iraqi military forces. And then, all of a sudden, a grenade. A grenade thrown by the hand of an insurgent came flying onto that rooftop. The grenade actually hit Michael Mansour in the chest and then landed in the middle of several servicemen. Well, without hesitation, he leapt on top of the grenade and covered it completely with his own body. The grenade exploded. Michael Mansour was killed. But all of his comrades were saved. Said a lieutenant who witnessed that heroic act of bravery, the only move that Mike made was down toward the grenade. Undoubtedly, he saved me and everyone else who was there. Petty Officer Second Class Michael Mansour is an American hero. By hurtling himself on top of a grenade, he made a great sacrifice. A great sacrifice. But, 
but he did not make the ultimate sacrifice. And I say this with the deepest respect for him and for what he did, knowing that I would never do the same myself. Michael Monsoor made a great sacrifice, but he did not make the ultimate sacrifice. And perhaps you hear this and say, what? Huh? <laughs> he didn't make the ultimate sacrifice? What more could he do? I mean, the man chose death. No, my friends. With all due respect, Michael Mansoor did not choose death. In all of history, one person and only one person has ever chosen death for another. Well, perhaps you hear this and say, huh? What? Only one person has ever chosen death for another? Uh, what about all those patriots that we celebrated just this past weekend? Uh, what about my father in World War II? Uh, what about my friend who never came back from Afghanistan? What about all of the men and women who reside now in Arlington National Cemetery? Friends, hear me. Some have chosen the timing of their death. Some have chosen the manner of their death. And make no mistake, those who have should be commended. They fully deserve every honor that we could pin to their chests and every medal that we could hang from their necks. But is it not true? Is it not true that all of them would have died at some point in time? All of them, every single one would have died at some point, right? Death would have come to them all. All of them would have died eventually, even if in very old age, by natural causes, but not Jesus Christ. No, Jesus Christ is eternal and everlasting. He lived long before time ever began, and he will live long after time ends. He always has been and always will be. He is immortal deathless, forever alive, and always young. He is God. He is life itself, the very absence of death. Death is something that he never had to taste, and yet he did. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul includes a hymn to Christ. It's called the centerpiece of the whole letter. And this is what he says. Have this mind among yourselves, writes Paul, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. My friends, Jesus is God. Jesus had equality with God, and yet he didn't consider equality with God something to use to exploit others. And so he emptied himself. The Greek word for this is kenosis, which means to pour out, like you might pour out a cup and its contents. Jesus poured himself out. He emptied himself completely of his own desires to take on the desires of God. He took his wants and wishes, his comfort and convenience, his privilege and his preference, and he poured them all out. He was obedient unto death, even so painful and ignominious a death as death on a cross. And he died not just for friends and not just for people who liked him, or fellow soldiers, or brothers in arms. No, he died for hopeless sinners like me. For those who should rightly be counted as enemies of God, as Paul says in another one of his letters. Some have chosen the timing of their death. And some have chosen the manner of their death, but only Jesus has ever chosen death. 
It was an option to him, and yet he took it. Why? Why did he do this? Well, of course, it was love. After he wrote his letter to the Philippians, Paul eked out a letter to the Ephesians. And to them, he says, live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Sacrifice to God. See what immense, incredible, indescribable love God has for you and me. Let us pledge our ultimate allegiance to God because God has made the ultimate sacrifice for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.